My name is Mike. Welcome to the Dash and Dot extravaganza. It's a small group, so it's actually kind of cool. We'll be able to play a lot today. Don't plan on sitting here and lecturing very long, okay? So I'm gonna go over a few things and then we're gonna get our hands on some robots and start doing some coding and write some programs and carry out some tasks with these robots here. As I said, I'm Mike Linquester. I teach second grade at Woodridge Elementary. Um, used to teach first grade, so this next year will be my first year in second grade. Okay, so who are or what are Dash and Dot? Dash and Dot are basically programmable robots. Dash, obviously he has the wheels, he dashes around. Dot just kind of sits there. Okay. Uh, basically they allow students to interact with them and gather information from their environment and make choices based on rules or code that students give to them. So they take in information from their environment, make decisions based on the code that the kids write, and produce tangible results. The kids get to see what they're writing. All right, this is just a quick video to kind of give you an overview of the Dash and Dot program. Um, these robots, it's, it's overwhelming to know what they can do. There's no way to really train on what these robots can do in one session. So I just really want to give you guys a general overview of what they can do and some ideas on what you might be able to do in a classroom with them. Um, yeah, so we'll check out this video. Coding is the writing of instructions for a computer to follow. When a kid codes, they learn that their code can transform into a program that can actually operate a machine. Coding is kind of like programming a robot to do whatever you want it to do. Algorithm is multiple steps that is telling the robot where to go. The robots really help the whole coding and programming process come to life. There is nothing more powerful to a young child than seeing cause and effect happen right in front of them. Dash and Dot provides students with hands-on opportunities to apply and experiment with concepts they are learning. Teaching even our youngest learners how to code and program really keeps the spirit of learning how things work alive. Teachers are always asked to transform their students into confident problem solvers. Coding absolutely meets this need. Coding challenges kids to take things step by step. It encourages them to make mistakes and use critical thinking skills to solve those problems and those mistakes. And they get to celebrate when something they code and program actually works. So hopefully that gave you a little bit of an overview of Dash and Dot and what they can do in the classroom. Uh, the biggest thing I wanted to point out in that video is what the teacher in the very beginning said that understanding the fundamentals of computer science or computer programming is a huge part of understanding the world around us. So like the video pointed out, pr um, robots or coding is everywhere. Um, you know, it's in the toaster you make your breakfast with. It's everywhere around us. And part of our job as educators this day and age is to prepare our students for the digital world. Those are the jobs that are going to be out there, so why not start early? Okay, so in our, what, hour and 20 minutes together, these are our objectives. So I will become familiar with the SAMR model for technology use in education. Um, the SAMR model is basically like the Bloom's taxonomy with, for technology use in education. It's kind of a reflection tool to look at it and to plan how we're going to use tech in our curriculum. Um, after we do the overview of the SAMR model, we're going to actually just play, play and program the robots. Um, there's a variety of tasks you can choose from, whatever you're comfortable with. We'll have the kids help us out. And then finally, I'm going to talk about where we can get funding for these things, because you guys might be thinking, OK, cool, you guys have robots. How am I going to get these, or when would I ever get these? Um, all of these robots right here I actually got from Donors Choose. Just went on there, wrote a grant. It was about $2,000 worth, and it got funded. So, and there's some other grants available, too, that just takes a little bit of essay writing, and it's doable. So what's a robot? It's a machine that can, like I said, take information from the environment, 
use the rules or the code that the programmer provides it and make decisions based on that. Okay, why do we want to learn code? We already talked about that in the video. It's, it's becoming more and more prevalent in our world. I don't think anybody would argue with that. And we just really need to prepare our students for the type of jobs that are going to be out there. Has anybody ever heard this TAMR model for tech use? Okay, good. Then this is actually a really good overview. Um, I like to think of the SAMR model as basically a master's degree in educational technology in 10 minutes. It covers everything related to educational technology. Um, I want to give credit where credit is due as part of being a good digital citizen. Um, all the slides and everything are from this YouTube video where students actually went on as a project and explained the SAMR model for other teachers. Okay. Um, they used a lot of Kathy Schrook's um, ideas as well as the Dr. Rubin who's behind the SAMR model. This is all their content, so I don't want to make sure I'm not taking credit for any of this. But basically the idea here is that technology is all around us. And how do we as teachers adapt to that technology. Okay, we can use something called the SAMR model. SAMR model is an, another acronym for us. S-A-M-R. S is for substitution, A augmentation, M modification, and R redefinition. Okay, so there's four different levels on two different plane surfaces, if you can think of it that way. Okay, so technology, as I said, it was invented, this model was thought up by Dr. Rubin, um, the great technologist who really works a lot with um, instructional and educational technology. And he believes that when we think differently, we can perform tasks differently, we can perform new tasks. We could think of the SAMR model as kind of a ladder. Um, just start down at the lowest level, just like Loon's taxonomy, with substitution. This is where a tech tool replaces something. There's no functional change. And if you take persuasive essay writing as an example, you give a kid an assignment, you say, I want you to write a persuasive or an opinion piece on this subject. Okay? Before technology that we think of today, you'd give the kid a pencil and that would be what they use. For substitution, the lowest kind of ring on the ladder there, you might give them a word processor. There's no functional change, the task is the same. You're just substituting it. That's kind of the lowest level of use of technology in the classroom. One step up from that is augmentation. That's when text acts as a direct tool substitute, but there's some functional improvement. So the first level, instead of a pencil, you're typing. Not much change there. The next one up, augmentation, you're still kind of substituting, but there is some sort of functional change on, on some sort of level. There's an improvement in some aspect. So an example of that would be you take from a word processor when you're writing that opinion piece or that persuasive essay, and you throw it into a Google Doc. Now you're sharing it, you're commenting on it, there's a collaboration piece. So that's that next level of educational technology where you're still doing essentially the same task, but now there's an added bonus that the tech is bringing in. Okay, so you're starting to get higher up on that kind of higher order thinking or higher or better use of technology in a classroom. This is where we want to kind of aim for the two highest points on the ladder here is substitution, I'm sorry, go ahead, one more, is modification and redefinition. Modification is the tech allows for a significant task redesign. All right, so if you take that same example of writing a persuasive essay, but this time we use a publisher like World or WordPress. That puts it out there to the world. Okay? The kids can get feedback from a variety of sources. So again, it's just taking the beginning model uh, from the word processor, just replacing the text, I'm sorry, replacing the pencil to the Google Doc, which is adding more tools. And now, the next level would be something like WordPress or an online publishing tool. Okay, at this level, the teacher kind of ceases to be the only audience. You start 
to gain other audiences around the world, and tech enables you to do that. The highest level, the kind of the goal of the use of educational technology is what we would call redefinition. This is where the technology we bring in to work with our students makes things possible that were previously inconceivable. Okay? So tech allows for the creation of new tasks. So the task is no longer the same. It's completely revised. And before that technology, it just wouldn't happen. Okay? Take, for instance, instead of actually writing that persuasive essay, they would take the same concept and create something digital, like on an online digital storytelling board or something. They could add in photos, music, animation, and again, share that with the world, a public audience, where their teacher is not the only one looking at it. Okay? They're getting feedback from all over the world. Okay, so that's kind of like the almighty that we're shooting for here. Okay? It's all about the task being is redesigned at this point. It's no longer just using a tech tool in place of something we already have, just because we can. And we all know that transformation equals new learning. Think of transformation as engagement. If the kids are engaged, they're going to learn more. So that's what I strive for when I'm using technology in my lesson planning is how is this going to affect the student's success? How is it going to affect what they learn? And to me, it all comes down to engagement. All right, so we went from substitution, just replacing that pencil with a keyboard, to augmentation, where they're typing it, but they're also being able to collaborate. They're bringing in some new aspects. Modification, there's more significant redesign of the task to redefinition where the task completely changes. Okay, as I start out with, people kind of think of the SAMR model as two different things. One could be, like I said in the beginning, a ladder. You start at point A and you want to get to the top. Okay. There's another school of thought where the SAMR model is like a swimming pool. You can visit one end and go to the next end later. Um, or like Disneyland, there's no one place to start or one ultimate goal. There's, so there's two different schools of thought on this. This is beneficial, especially for teachers that are new to the use of technology in your classroom. It's okay to start at substitution because we have to start somewhere. And it's okay to go back to that because maybe that has a good use or that's going to provide for some more powerful engagement. So a SAMR model, we can think of it as a ladder, kind of that lower bottom part trying to get to the top where we are producing tasks for the kids or engagement for the kids, activities for the kids that they could not possibly have done before the use of that technology. SAMR model is a good tool to reflect on and to plan why you're using the technology, what you're going to use it for, and how you're going to use it. That's so a good tool for us to use to make sure that we're not just using the technology just because we can, or just because it looks cool. So it's not the tech, it's how we use it. And again, the entire goal of all the tech use is student success. Hope that made some sense to you guys. Luckily we have a small group, so everybody can have their own. Let's uh, invite you guys to come on up, grab an iPad, grab a device, grab a robot, turn them on, and we'll get started. All right, so let's start. Just go ahead and open up your, to your home screen on your devices. You look a little different than mine. You're going to look for this app right here. It's called Blockly. So this is a programming, pro programming program, a code writing program uh, developed by Google, especially for Dash and Dot. It makes it very easy for even kids as young as TK to start coding and getting those concepts of, of computer science down early. All right. So when the robot comes out of the box, you're going to download five apps. They're all free. They're all under Wondershare Workshop. I'll have a link to this, um, or this uh, Google slide. They'll have all these links for you. But they're all free after you buy the very expensive robots. Okay. 
First step is going to be to connect your robot. The iPads connect to the robots via Bluetooth. So you hit the plus button there, and it's going to search for them. It shouldn't find any of them right now because we haven't turned them on. So I'm going to borrow one real quick, which is Princess. I let my kids name these, so if you see some odd names, that was first graders right there. All right. So yes, they're adorable. They also get very annoying when you have 15 of them going, but you'll see in a minute. All right, so you can just kind of chill on your iPods for a minute and watch a few things I do, and then we'll just let you go at it. Okay, so now I hit find again, and it found the robot. I wrote their names on their heads, because when you search in a, in a classroom, if you do get a class set of these, or even 15 of them like I do, the kids are like, oh, which one's mine? That one's mine. They start arguing. It's fun. Let them name them. They Googled um, robot names. And yeah, helps you find it. So I'm connecting to Princess. I believe Claire named this one. I'm not sure. No. No? OK. Oh, you named yours Claire, huh? Yeah. Oh, sorry. It's Claire. All right, so that brings up Blockly. Some of these have already been played with, so you might have some code on there that kids have already written. You can just trash it. So you just grab the whole thing, bring it down through the trash can, and that'll get rid of that code. Okay. Sometimes it holds together, sometimes it doesn't. You just have to play with it. Throw it away. Oh, see. So you can imagine doing this on the iPods versus the iPads. It gets very, very frustrating, especially for six-year-olds. You can leave the win start on there. Okay. First thing I want to show you is basically. It's reacting to me, by the way. <laughs> One of the easiest lesson plans to do on this is to develop a maze for the robot to do. This can help with non-standard measurement in first grade. That's what we did for non-standard measurement. Instead of centimeters, we just told them it was 10 dash movements. So the when start is the first code. Everything you do has to start with when you press the play button, your code will start running. On the side here, those are your categories of code that you want the robot to do. So in this case, if I wanted the robot if I wanted the robot to go around the chair. Okay? First thing I would do is go to drive. And it keeps looking at me because they have sensors that towards or turn towards sound if you have a program that way. When you press the drive category, it comes up with all these different options here. All I wanted to do first, another healthy, handy tip is to keep a, like a piece of tape on the ground for a starting point when you're having the kids program them. And they're pointed in the right direction. So I want them to go forward. Uh, in first grade, since we're doing non-standard measurement, I don't get into centimeters. We just, I just say 50. You want them to go forward 50 dash movements. They can change the speed. And then when you press the arrow, that adds that line of code to your program. And you connect it. So it's called Blockly. You connect the blocks. So now if I say run the program, and I press press play, it's going to run the program. OK, let's go for it. Let's just turn them on, open up the Blockly app, explore it, try to go around in a circle, try to make a square, see what else it can do. The kids are here to help, I'm here to help. So it has the power button on the side. And you'll see all these robots are starting to show up now. There you go. Absolutely. Oh. Yep. The kids can show you all that. So one of the main missions I was hoping for you guys to do today is to grab a chair and just write a program to go around the chair. Oh, I need to do it twice. 
Exactly. So it's all about those higher order thinking skills of planning ahead, problem solving. So after you guys advance past the, uh, the stages of just being able to, to know how to make it go around an object, then you can start looking at the if this then that scenarios of coding. So under there it's under um, control. Yeah, you could put codes in that will repeat what you wrote. So if you want to go forward 50 centimeters, mm -hmm. but you don't want to write that code four times, just put go to control to the repeat and change the number of times you want to do it. Mm. Okay? Or there's ops like um, if it senses an obstacle in front of it, you can put that code in there to tell it what to do it when it sees it's about to run into the chair. So if it's about to run into the chair, then you tell it to do this. So it gets into the if this, then that scenarios, which, which the kids are going to run into when they're actually coding later on. So if anybody wants to try to figure out some accessories, there's things like ball launchers, xylophones, all sorts of contractions. Try it again. Okay, we're getting there. So this is set. This is still what? A little too far still. A little too far still, so let's move it down, huh? About right here. Now it's right again. Keep going, right? It keeps going over the ball. So what should we do? What does this need to do? It's going over the ball. What do we need it to do? Because it keeps it. doing that, huh? We need to say that again. Lower it. Lower it. Let's lower it. Okay. So before we make adjustments, let's run it so that it goes to the spot where it's going to be. Okay. So the launching is good, right? We just gotta load that ball. So let's see what happens when it actually launches. Go ahead. Okay. So that's what we want it to do. But our mission is to. Load it and launch it, right? Touch it. And not even touch it, right? So let's see one more time what it does when it launches. Cool, right? It did. It did. But we want to do it right and not give up, right? So let's try it again. Close. It's not loading, right? Probably we need to do left. You want to try the left? Okay. We're still a little too high, huh? All right, so up on the board are some resources. If anybody is interested in trying to get one or class sets, these are some of the best ways to get it. Just, there's federal grants available. Um, donors choose is obviously a really good choice. I've gotten tons of stuff on there. It just takes the time to write that essay, make it persuasive, and there's people out there that will fund these projects. Thank you.